Hi, my name is Bean Kim. I am honored to give this keynote at iClear this year. I'm going to talk about beyond interoperability, developing a language to shape our relationships with AI. AIs are everywhere now. They help doctors make medical decisions. They play games like Go, chess. They decide what we see on social media. They index and process our memories. Many of you are working to make these AIs even smarter. Sometimes they do things that we don't understand. For example, when AlphaGo defeated the world Go champion Isedor in 2016, it made its famous move 37, which the Nindan commentator referred to as a very strange move. Go players continue to analyze and discuss this move to this day. How did AlphaGo know this move was a good idea? Wouldn't it be nice to ask AlphaGo to explain it to us? That reminds me of the movie Arrival where aliens arrive on Earth in this giant space capsule in the sky, and a scientist tries to decipher aliens' language to communicate with them. This is a good metaphor for AI. Because AI did kind of arrive like aliens in two ways. An explosion of AI advances and applications that was sudden, and we don't know how to talk with them either. I argue that we need a language to talk to them because AIs will make increasingly complex and important decisions, but will they do things in the way that we want them to do, respecting our values? Brian Christian's book, The Alignment Problem, puts this beautifully, in that the essence of the alignment problem is the disconnect between the intention, the purpose we desire, and the results, the purpose put into the machine. I like this book not just because it references some of my work, TCAV, which I'm going to talk about briefly later, but also because Brian hits the nail on the head in that the ultimate goal of this language is to align AI and our values. Just like when we meet a new coworker, we talk to them to learn about how they work, their strengths and weaknesses, and that is how we should work with AI too. And this talk is about work we're doing to enable this. We can visualize this alignment problem. I will formalize this later, but for now, just consider that circle on the left represents what humans know and their representational space. For example, you understand when I say this dog is fluffy. And the circle on the right represents what machines know, their representational space. There's probably some overlap between the two, but it's likely that there are things that we don't yet have a representation for, like the move 37. Ideally, these two representational spaces would have perfect overlap, but this is not going to happen. This doesn't even happen between two humans. So the goal is to maximize the overlap by expanding what we know through dialogues and collaboration with machines. And learning more about machines will enable us to build machines that can better align with our goal. What would this language look like? It may not look like human languages at all. It may not have nouns, verbs, sentences, but it may have some elements or medium that we exchange with machines, like images, pixels, or concepts. We will develop not just one, but many languages, depending on what we are trying to do, the goal, because the goal changes the aspect of the language that needs to be precise. There's a lot of debate in interpretability about what faithfulness is. It depends on the goal. For example, if we're working together on building a bridge, then getting metrics right is important. If we're working on writing a diplomatic document together, getting the precise meaning of a word in the international context is crucial. Naturally, how good the language is will be evaluated depending on how well it achieves the goal. Humanity has done this many times. We invented math to communicate precise and complex mechanisms. We're still inventing new computer programming languages to communicate instructions for computers to execute. While we don't yet know what this language would look like, we do know the important axis of this language. First, it should reflect the nature of the machines, just like human languages. We do this by studying machines as scientific objects in isolation and with humans. Why does nature matter? Well, I speak two languages, Korean and English, and I know the word chung in Korean is something that you can't properly understand the meaning without understanding our culture. It's so complex that there is even an article about it. I imagine machines' nature will be even more complex than this, and we have to know their culture to make the language to be more expressive, accurate, and efficient. There's already a lot of great work around this aspect. In this talk, I will share some of our work that focuses on the nature of perceptual differences in humans and machines. For example, whether machines see triangles in this picture, like we do, with the Gestalt phenomenon. 
I'll also share studies of machines and humans together. The second important axis is that the language should be designed to expand what we know, like to understand that move 37 in AlphaGo. It's going to be complex, so we would need to be able to go back and forth through dialogue. Along with a general tool, we will report our study on a very special alien, AlphaZero, a self-trained chess playing machine from DeepMind. But before, I want to talk about how existing efforts fit into this picture. Right now, we mostly communicate with machines by crafting objective functions that machines optimize, or by building tests at deployment time, just like software engineering. Doing this is important, but not enough. The full impact of our objective function or testing is unknown to us because we can only understand this part while there's potentially a bigger part that we simply can't see. In other words, we don't know what to test. For example, say we have added a fairness metric to our model. We had good intentions, but it might discriminate against some other group without us realizing. And we won't know this until something goes wrong, and by then, it might be too late. We also can't just collect all these metrics and optimize all of them, because some fairness metrics are mathematically proven to be incompatible. So you can't have it all. You have to choose. I want to emphasize that sometimes testing alone is enough when you know what to test. We get on airplanes without understanding them because there has been enough empirical evidence that we are likely to survive again. But with AI, we don't have that much evidence yet and we don't even know what to test. And until then, we have to do something. And that doing something is called interpretability. It's a subfield of machine learning that I've been working on for a while. The goal of interpretability is to engineer our relationships with AI, in part by making tools to produce explanations from machine learning models. These tools are useful, but knowing the nature of these machines is something we need in interpretability. Let me give you an example. Here are examples of popular explanation methods called saliency maps. For an image classification model, each pixel is assigned to a number, indicating how important it is for prediction. And this is what they look like. They use gradients from the model or use perturbation to generate explanations. You may look at these explanations and go, oh, that makes sense. They are highlighting where the bird is in the image. Here is the bad news. The two explanations you just saw aren't actually created equal. In fact, one is from a trained network, while the other one is from an untrained network. In other words, explanations that are supposed to explain prediction seems to have nothing to do with prediction. These two networks make fundamentally different prediction decisions based on different logic. Is that okay? Well, if my doctor accidentally used an untrained model to decide my medical condition, and if an explanation can't give them a hint that they're about to make a decision that could change my life, I don't think it's fine. But are you sure you can't tell the difference? Look closer. Do you see anything? If you thought you can tell them apart, I assure you that you cannot, because that's not the explanation from the untrained network. This is. I just intentionally switched them. If you convinced yourself that you can tell the difference, you've just experienced a well-known phenomenon called confirmation bias. Humans are good at only seeing the evidence that supports their belief. And I think this bias is partly why our community never discovered this phenomenon until, honestly, we only stumbled upon it. For years, we looked at these explanations and said, this makes sense. Many work on these methods, including myself. Despite much follow-up work on this phenomenon, we still don't fully understand this phenomenon. Is this because one, the information is there, we just can't see it? Perhaps we're using the wrong medium, pixels? Or two, are these methods simply wrong? But these methods are shown to be useful for certain tasks. What this work points out is the large gap in our fundamental understanding of what these explanations are showing and what they can and cannot be used for. To fill that gap, we need to study machines as objects of scientific study so that these tools can be derived from them. So what does that look like? Let me share a few of our work focusing on differences and similarities in perception of humans and machines, how they see the world. The Gestalt effect is a strong tendency in human visual system to complete an incomplete shape. For example, we see these dots as two groups, 
but we see these other dots as a continuum. The one we studied is called closure effect. When I show you this picture, your eyes can't help but seeing a triangle, even though the picture only has three brackets. There is no triangle in this picture. This is a very strong visual phenomenon to us. Some have argued that it is for survival. If there's a bear behind a tree, we need to still recognize it as a bear quickly as possible, only seeing parts of it. Do the machines have a gestalt effect too? We use a simple metric that we call closure measure to answer this question, which is in the machine's activation space, how similar the gestalt triangle is to the full triangle compared to when edges are rotated, no longer having a closure effect using cosine similarity. We carefully control for potential confoundings like simple pixel overlap, background color, position, and rotation angles. This graph shows the closure metric in the y-axis as the edges of these brackets get longer. This is a classical way of measuring the effect in humans. We trained a few networks with different characteristics. Some are trained with random labels, so it overfits at training, but it doesn't know how to generalize. We also trained one with shuffled pixels that destroy the structural information in the image, and this one also doesn't know how to generalize. What we found is that neural networks have a closure effect, but only when it has learned to generalize, just like humans do. This relation between human-like perception tendency and neural networks' generalizability is interesting. Does that mean that we should build in human-like perception into these machines to make them better? Maybe. What about strong visual tendencies like illusion? Many ideas from human studies can be borrowed to study our aliens. So this work shows how similar human and machine perception is, but are they also different in some way? Yes, in this preliminary study, we show just how different we see the world versus machines. So we're going to talk about saliency maps again because despite the questions raised, they're still widely used, so studying them is still useful. These two sets of explanations come from two different models. If you ask me, I don't think I can tell them apart. They look the same to me. But it turns out that neural network is able to see what I cannot see. When we train a neural network to tell these explanations apart, it can tell which model an explanation came from with a very high accuracy. Even when the explanations are from two models with different seeds, but identical in every other way, data, architecture. And the other way around is true too. Here are explanations for two methods in each column. I think the gradient visually look different than integrated gradient, but to machines, they look pretty similar. A model trained on one can easily generalize to the other. So these two works show how humans and machines see the world differently by studying machines in isolation. Now we're going to add another complex system in the mix, humans. In particular, we're going to look at how humans interact with explanations provided by machines. For example, how do the factors of explanations like length influence humans through large-scale human experiments? In this work, we looked at what happens when explanations are not perfect. What am I showing you here is a game. In this game, the subjects are playing as a chef in a busy kitchen. Their goal is to run a successful restaurant, making complete meals as quickly as possible. They sometimes get advice from a machine, which they can take it or not. Each control group gets a different type of explanation, one that anchors the explanations to a higher level goal, like showing the forest instead of just a tree, like we're chopping tomatoes to prepare pasta. The other was just telling them what to do next, just showing a tree. Other times, they got no explanation. Some groups got intentionally noisy explanations, noisy forest or noisy tree. We use an optimal planner that generates explanations with any amount of noise of our choice. Our goal is to figure out the impact of noisy explanations across different types. It turns out that if we anchor the explanations to a higher level goal, showing them the forest, even the noisy version, the noisy forest, still help humans in complex planning tasks. But if we only show a tree, there is more degradation in human performances when the noise was added. Perhaps that by itself is not too surprising, but here is what was surprising to me. Noisy forests are almost as good as perfect forests if we use these explanations only for training humans. So instead of guiding humans at deployment time, if we use them for training only, then the forest or the noisy forest type of explanation help humans perform statistically significantly better than all other conditions. This gives hope 
that even if explanations aren't perfect, because they never will, they can help humans to be more efficient in complex tasks. So what other complex tasks can explanation help? What about detecting errors in the machine learning system? To test this, we intentionally injected errors in the system, like labeling errors or spurious correlation at training time, among others. Then we show an input image of prediction and an explanation, different methods for each group, some saliency, some are not, to a human subject. Then we ask our subject if they would deploy the system. We're testing whether explanations can help them validate the machine learning system. The results were rather disappointing. The only error humans could detect this way was spurious correlation. So in a follow-up work that's published in this conference, we ran another study to see just what kind of spurious correlation humans can detect in the medical domain. Some spurious correlation might be visible, like the MGH letters on the top left corner do not carry any diagnostic information, and some might be less visible, like Gaussian blur. The TLDR is that existing methods can help only if you knew what the spurious signals are. Here as a baseline, a, a normal model that is not using the spurious signals of MGH tags, and here is a spurious model that is using MGH tags to classify. If you knew the MGH tag might be a problem and test it for it, then you're good, because then it falls into this region that we can understand. You can kind of see the MGH being highlighted. But if you didn't suspect the tag would be a problem and therefore didn't test for it, then subjects were not able to detect the errors. And that is again why expanding what we know is important. That leads us to the next part of this talk, the second axis of this language, that it should be designed to expand what we know. I will share a general tool that we worked on towards expanding what we know before taking a deep dive on one specific alien of interest, AlphaZero from DeepMind. Finally, I'll share a fun art project we did to enable machines to inspire our creativity. To develop a tool, a bit of formalization of the diagram we've been looking at is helpful, and this is done in the work that was covered in the book. We can think of each circle as a representational space. A dot in this space is something that makes sense to us, like it could be a sentence, and the sentence can be decomposed into some bases. For example, I can say the cat is big, can be decomposed into a cat basis and is big basis. Now, what are the machine's bases? We might share some with them, but likely machines will have their own way of decomposing their world. Maybe it has a basis that represents something weird like pixel two and 10 and 56. There will be bases that we don't have a word for yet. This work TCAV is the simplest way to find this alignment between a vector in our space to one in machine space. We do this by collecting a few examples of a concept like striped from humans and pass it over to a machine who is trained to look at images to get their representation of these striped images. But how do we know whether these striped concepts exist in machines or not? Is this concept something that only humans know or is it something we both know? We can test how coherent a machine's representation is compared to random concepts. Instead of concept pictures, we pass random pictures to machines if the striped concept means anything to machines, they should be more coherent than random concepts. Technically speaking, we do this by running t-testing or Walsh's testing to reject the null hypothesis that striped and random have statistically significantly different distributions. Now we have this vector that means something to us represented in the machine space, we can start asking interesting questions. Was the machine's prediction of zebra sensitive to this striped concept? What about black stripes? We do this simply by using directional derivatives. Intuitively speaking, this means how sensitive the prediction of zebra is to the striped concept. If I change a bit of this concept, would prediction of zebra change a lot? If it does, it's an important concept. We can aggregate the directional derivatives to produce a TCAP score, which is always between zero and one. This is a ratio of pictures with positive directional derivatives. With this vector that maps our concepts onto the machine's space, we can also enable controllability. In this work, we bake these concepts in the middle of the model, a bottleneck layer. Then we jointly train the model for classification and the concept labels. Once these concepts are baked in, we can control them at inference time. For example, we can say now tree or lion concepts aren't important to predict zebras, 
So we zero out those neurons and propagate to get a new prediction. We tested in a medical domain with existing expert data. And by simulating intervention by experts, we're able to reduce total error of the model as well as improving controllability. Note that this alignment is not going to be perfect. What humans think of stripes might be different from what machines think. And this is probably true between two humans. So how good alignment is good enough? In papers, we can only test with synthetic data set with ground truth, but the ultimate test is whether this method can be used to help in practice. Papers like these that use TCAP in medicine and science are likely to be the best evidence. For example, a paper from King's College London uses a medical concept called left ventricle, this is a part of your heart, to understand a model that classifies cardiac health. The way that this paper put it in their conclusion is possibly the best way to explain why. They say using known biomarkers, like the left ventricle, allows the model's prediction to be placed in the context of current medical knowledge and clinical decision-making guidelines. In other words, using concepts that doctors are trained to use as the element of language, we're making this language work for not just machine learning researchers, but also experts in other fields. And I think this is the right place to start developing this language, choosing the element of language that best serves humans. And this excitement went beyond machine learning research and papers. This work is widely popular at Google, enough for Sundar to highlight this work at his Google I.O. keynote. It also got UNESCO Net Explorer Award for one of 10 innovations with the potential of profound and lasting impact. So while I showed off this TCAP work, we're still talking about using concepts that make sense to us, like stripes. How do we take this to the next level, expanding what we know, discovering concepts that will help us achieve our goal even better? Here are a few works that we've done over the past years towards expanding what we know. We leverage the fact that examples are powerful. So we use examples to let machines express a new concept. We do this by decomposing the embedding space using PCA or using a clustering algorithm. Now, each principal component could be seen as a machine's concept or basis, but expressed in a way we can understand. For example, a train class, it seems to be paying attention to the tiles on the platform. For a dumbbell class, it's not actually looking at the dumbbell. It's looking at the humans who are holding dumbbells. So this simple method already reveals so much about how machine's thinking is different from how we would have guessed it. You can also measure how complete these discovered concepts are because perhaps not all concepts can be expressed using parts of images. But maybe the machine's concept is too wild to be expressed using our images. Maybe we should let them draw it. We investigate this in a paper published at this conference, Dissect. The method is simple to describe, but harder to make it work. Given an already trained classification model, we attach a generative model that is trained using gradients of the classification model. And that way, it is using its own language derivatives to transfer what it knows into something we can understand, pictures. These are just a few initial directions to expand to what we know, each of which has their own limitations. For example, the way we validate new discovered concept is using one synthetic data set with ground truth or two, in practice with domain experts. So then we thought, instead of developing general tools, what if we take a deep dive on one special alien to really study how they see the world? And that's what we did when we studied AlphaZero, a self-trained chess playing model from DeepMind and collaborating with a world chess champion. Self-trained means that it was trained by playing against itself. And that means that it never ever saw how humans play chess. And this is interesting because if we can show it naturally learns to share some basis with us, that gives us more hope to expand what we know. And this AlphaZero is not just any self-trained chess playing machine, it plays it very, very well. It beats the Stockfish engine, which is arguably the best chess engine out there, after only four hours of training from scratch. We were fortunate to have Vlad, a former world chess champion, and also a co-author of this paper, who has a better chance of talking to this alien than any of us and provides some qualitative insights for us. The first question is, do human chess concepts exist in AlphaZero or does it learn to play in a completely different way? It turns out it does, but what concept is learned when and where varies. 
some like material imbalance is learned then forgotten as Alpha Zero gets better at playing, and others like in check, which is pretty critical for winning the game, learned throughout. What's interesting is that one can argue that material imbalance is something that novice chess player might use to play at first, but experts know that the imbalance isn't enough to win the game. And it seems that Alpha Zero goes through a similar phase too. Thanks to data from chess base, we can also compare the evolution of a human's chess playing versus Alpha Zero's. The left graph is showing the proportion of different opening moves and how they evolved over the pretty much entire recorded human history of chess since 1400. On the right is how Alpha Zero's opening moves evolve, and they look pretty different. It's particularly interesting how Alpha Zero has more diverse opening moves than humans. It's also interesting that there's a point at which things click for Alpha Zero, and it also chooses its style of play. This explosion of skills aligns with Vlad's qualitative assessment and our quantitative observation. Finally, we take a first step towards expanding what we know. This is a small step because validating a new chess concept is likely to require many more than one world chess champion, so that will take time. But in the meanwhile, we built a tool that lets you explore Alpha Zero's representational space. We use non-negative matrix factorization of principal technique to decompose Alpha Zero's embeddings. This is an exciting first step towards many potential follow-up works. So far, we've been only thinking about aligning ourselves with machines. But what if we can use our lack of alignment to inspire creativity for humans? The final work I'd like to share is not an academic paper. It's a project we did with designers and artists to explore subjectivity and expressions through AI. We're open sourcing all the tools we made. When a designer communicates and works with another designer, they use what's called mood board, a collection of visual materials to communicate the feel of an idea or concept to have a form of visual dialogue. What if we have this with machines? Could it reveal something inspiring, surprising, but still meaningful? We explore this idea with a tool we built called Moodboard Search to enable this visual dialogue with machines. The way it works is that humans first provide some seating images just to get the conversation started. For example, an artist we worked with made a concept of sight unseen, which he describes as finding seemingly ordinary but beautiful details from your surroundings. Then machines map these images onto its representational space. We use TCAP to do this, then respond with another set of images from a different pool, sometimes after cropping them to better express the idea. This is how the dialogue between Alex and the machine went. Alex's comment that how it showed him a view from his own photography that he won't normally see, essentially describes the goal of this project. Now we have a machine's representation of Alex's concept, we can have visual dialogues with other artists through the machine. We shared these results over a Zoom call in real time because it was a pandemic, and the response was overwhelming. Rachel said, open up the world through a different lens. You could use it to escape the ordinary. And that is what a great coworker would do. They help you see things from a different angle. And here, the machine was able to do this for Rachel. We're publishing Moodboard Search along with an app called the Concept Camera, where you can point your camera and see what you see in someone else's eyes using their concepts. Projects like this represent a different type of expanding what we know to bring out something surprising in ourselves. So today we talked about studying the nature of machines, how they perceive the world and how their explanations influence humans. We also talked about first steps towards expanding what we know using concept-based dialogue or through an in-depth study. This is just a very small portion of the work we can do to proactively shape our relationships with AI. Languages shape the way we think. We have an opportunity to shape our own thinking and future machines. And here are my amazing collaborators over the past many years who I am not sure if I have the right human concept to express how lucky I feel to have worked with them. Also, thanks to Michael Lipman, Sammy Benjio, and Yejin Che for their feedback on this talk. Thank you.